Well, welcome to our second session on uh, looking at Jesus and the law, or looking, uh, I've sometimes called it the law and the new covenant, because that's really at the heart of what we're talking about. In our first session, we looked at Jesus and his teaching on the law and uh, his practice and what it told us about his perspective on the law. And this week we're having, or this session, we're having two sessions, this second session and third session, looking at the writings of Paul on this subject. And we're breaking it over two sessions, partly because there is so much material. Uh, this is perhaps one of the most complex subjects in Paul's letters. In fact, there's a lot of uh, scholarly debate and writing. There's so many things written on this topic. Um, there's often not much in uh, the way of consensus, or not complete consensus. There's a lot of controversy. Um, and so even over two sessions, we can't possibly cover every passage, every verse, everything we might want to say about Paul and the law. But we are going to explore as much as we can um, to get the sort of many-sided portrait that Paul has of the law. And depending a little bit on time, how this time goes in this session, the, the goal I have at least is to start off by looking, giving a sort of an overview of what Paul says about the law and how he understands it as uh, for Christians. And then in our second session, uh, we may need to continue part of this for our second session, but our second session have something of a focus on, okay, uh, how is Paul saying now we should, what should we do with this law? How should it apply given what Paul has said about it? Now, if we think about uh, Paul's picture of the law, we might ask ourselves, you know, what does Paul think of the law? Does he think it's a good thing? Is it something we should follow today? Is it what uh, God has for us today? And again, just uh, for any who didn't catch the first session, we're talking about the Old Testament law as it appears in the first five books of the Old Testament. Or does he think it's a bad thing? We don't need it anymore. Um, it's come to an end. What, what does he think about it? Well, we get quite a complex picture in Paul's letters. One famous verse from uh, Romans 7, verse 12, Paul says that the law is holy, just, or some translations say righteous, and good. Well, that's pretty emphatic. And yet, in Galatians, and we're going to come to some of these passages later, he depicts the law as something which enslaves us, a power that enslaves us. He uh, depicts it as something that increases trespasses in Romans 5. Uh, in Romans 7, he uses that in the hands of sin, the law was used to bring about death. So that's quite a, a complex picture. How could he say that first phrase and yet also say what he says in those next sections? Uh, and as I um, said in our session last week, it's a great thing to sort of make notes, to remind yourself of what's going on as you go through a session like this, but at the same time, um, the PDF is, of this session is going to be made available uh, on as a link on YouTube, and it's actually already available for the first session on YouTube. So, on the one hand, we have um, what appear to be contradictory statements sometimes. So in Ephesians chapter 2, verse 15, he mentions, uh, he talks about Christ abolishing the law, abolishing the law. And yet at the same time, approvingly, later in the same letter in Ephesians chapter 6, he cites what he calls a commandment, and that is the fifth commandment from the Ten Commandments, to honour your father and mother. And that, of course, is the Ten Commandments was at the heart of the law. So how could Paul talk about the law being abolished and yet at the same time talk about, uh, yet actually cite a commandment that's at the heart of the law in his defence, in his uh, argument or his teaching to the Ephesians? And even more confusingly, and sometimes we, uh, we, wouldn't, we wouldn't notice this necessarily in our English translations, depending on what it decides to do here, but um, in Romans 3, verse 31, he asks the rhetorical question, do we then overthrow the law? And then he replies, by no means. On the contrary, we uphold the law. Now, the thing is, the verb that is often translated overthrow here is actually the same verb that many translations translate abolish, in Ephesians 2.15. So he talks about Christ abolishing the law in Ephesians, but using the same verb, he says, do we then effectively abolish the law? Romans 3, no, of course not, no way, no way, Jose. How can we have both, same writer? Even more fascinating, we get um, 
this verse from 1 Corinthians 7. And I've been reading a book recently simply called Paul and the Law. And the subtitle is Keeping the Commandments of God, or Keeping the Commands of God. And the book starts with this kind of conundrum, this puzzle of this one verse. This is the verse he uses, the author uses to sort of frame his, his book on this topic, where Paul says, circumcision is nothing, and uncircumcision is nothing, but, uh, this is a literal translation, but keeping the commands of God, or your translation might say what matters or what's important, what you should do is keep the commands of God. Now, as Christian readers, we can verily, very easily, uh, not verily, verily, but very easily read over this and say, well, yeah, that makes sense. We know that as Christians, we're not supposed to be circumcised. It doesn't really matter whether we're circumcised or not. It's not the key thing, but we certainly need to be obedient to God. What's the issue? There's nothing, there's nothing in the verse that would catch our attention. But the problem is that circumcision was at the very heart of the law, the Old Testament law. You remember that in, giving God, in God giving Abraham the covenant, the sign of the covenant was circumcision. That was, that was the absolute defining identity marker for what it meant to be uh, one of the people of God, at least for Jewish males. Um, and then the, the law that God gave in, in uh, Exodus, and we read about it in other places, the Ten Commandments and other laws, uh, was not in order to become the people of God. You're already the people of God, but your sign of obey, obeying the covenant is keeping uh, and staying within the covenant is keeping the law. So in fact, if you're to abandon circumcision, that's as good as annulling the law. One, one well-known scholar called this one of the most amazing sentences Paul ever wrote, if you think about the Jewish background. Um, but yet, Paul says, well, what really matters is keeping the commandments. At this point, a Jewish person would be incredibly confused, thinking, well, but hang on, circumcision is the number one commandment. <laughs> circumcision is at the heart of the law. And also this phrase, keeping the commands or keeping the commandments, is used in other places in Jewish literature, and it's talking about keeping the law of Moses, keeping the Old Testament law. So again, something that seems very confusing on the surface of things. So we're going to read a few passages. We're going to focus on a small number of passages today and uh, hopefully get through all of them, or at least some of them, because I'm the only one with a microphone, I'll, I'll need to read them. But we're going to start with Galatians 3. Uh, so this is at the top of your screen. We're going to start with Galatians 3, verses 10 to 26. I won't read every single, I won't uh, deal with every single verse, but I will read all the verses. So this is a key passage as we think about the law. And in fact, Galatians, Paul's letter to the Galatians, has more references to the law proportionately, remembering it only has six chapters, than any other letter by Paul. Uh, I think the next one would be Romans. Romans has uh, more references, but then it also has 16 chapters, it's much, uh, and it has some very long chapters, so it's much longer. So Galatians and Romans contain the most references to the law and proportionately the most in Galatians. So we are going to look at a bit at Galatians today and a bit at Romans and another passage as well. So, just reading now from Galatians chapter 3, verse 10 to 26. So, Paul has been talking about um, the, the contrast between being justified, being put right with God through faith in Jesus Christ, and seeking to be justified, seeking to be um, at least vindicated or appear to be in the right by doing the works of the law. And the works of the law I would take to be the practice of the Jewish law. There's a whole discussion about works of the law, which is very complicated, but that's what we're going to consider it to be today, living out obedience to the Jewish law. So Paul says, for all who rely, verse 10, on the works of the law are, are under a curse. For it is written, cursed is everyone who does not observe and obey all the things written in the, uh, the book of the law. And he's citing here from Deuteronomy. Now it's evident that no one is justified before God by the law, for <clears throat> the one who is righteous will live by faith. Here he's citing Habakkuk, and this appears in other places in his writings as well, this verse. But the law does not rest on faith. On the contrary, whoever does the works of the law will live by them. Now here he's actually citing or alluding to a verse in Leviticus. Christ redeemed us from the curse of the law by becoming a curse for us. For it is written, cursed is everyone who hangs on a tree. That's from Deuteronomy. Now notice here, when he's talking against relying on the works of the law, he's actually citing lots of verses or alluding to or echoing lots of verses from the law, Leviticus and Deuteronomy. 
Verse 14, in order that in Christ Jesus the blessing of Abraham might come to the Gentiles so that we might receive the promise of the Spirit through faith. Brothers and sisters, I give an example from daily life. Once a person's will or a person's covenant, it's the same word, this word for testament, covenant, will, it's the same word in Greek, has been ratified, no one adds to it or annuls it. Now the promises were made to Abraham and to his offspring. Some translations will say and to his seed, which is literally what it says in the Greek, his, his offspring. As it does, um, it does not say and to offsprings, plural, or to seeds, plural, as of many, but it says and to your offspring or seed, singular, that is, to one person who is Christ. My point is this, the law which came 430 years later does not annul a covenant previously ratified by God so as to nullify the promise. For if the inheritance comes from the law, it no longer comes from the promise. But God granted it to Abraham through the promise. Why then the law? It was added because of transgressions until the offspring would come or the seed would come to whom the promise had been made, and it was ordained through angels by a mediator. Now a mediator involves more than one party, but God is one. Is the law then opposed to the promises of God? Certainly not. For if a law had been given that could make alive, then righteousness would indeed come through the law. But scripture has imprisoned all things under the power of sin, so that what was promised through faith in Jesus Christ might be given to those who believe. Now before faith came, we were imprisoned and guarded, guarded under the law until faith would be revealed. Therefore the law was our disciplinarian, and you might have a different word in your translation, uh, until Christ came so that we might be justified by faith. But now that faith has come, we are no longer subject to a disciplinarian, for in Christ Jesus you are all children of God through faith. Now that is a long and a very complex passage and we could spend at least today, if not other sessions, just looking at this passage. But we don't have time to do that. Uh, so we're just going to look at some relevant issues specific to our question today and we're going to have to miss out other things that you might want to know about, like references to angels and other things that we just don't have time to look at. So let's focus first of all on verses 10 to 12. I'm just going to focus on a couple of, uh, two or three different sections. So if you look over again, verses 10 to 12, why does Paul say that all who rely on works of the law are under a curse? Why, why does it seem that Paul is saying that here? Well, you can't, I mean, I don't know for sure, but you can't keep all of the law, so you're basically cursed from the beginning because there's no way to... Yeah, so Frank is saying that uh, um, the curse comes because you're required to obey the whole law and uh, you can't keep all the laws, no one manages to keep everything perfectly. So that, uh, the, the verse that we'd read from Deuteronomy already talks about cursed as those who do not obey all the things written in the law. Yeah, any other thoughts? That's, that's a great, uh, great answer, yeah. Any other thoughts, to, anything else to add to that that anyone wanted to, to say? The only thing I was thinking is that there is faith isn't addressed at all in that. Right, faith, it, yeah. It, it, it sounds like it's totally works. Mm -hmm. so, yeah, so Bonnie is saying um, uh, faith doesn't seem to be addressed when Paul is talking about the law here. It's, it's not about faith, it seems, it's about works. Yeah, that's absolutely right. And that's what it says in verse 12, actually. Uh, but the law does not rest on faith. On the contrary, whoever does the works of the law will live by them. So this is exactly what the two of you have just said. Um, there's a curse for not fulfilling the covenant. No one fulfills it perfectly. Paul assumes that no one keeps the law. And here he characterizes law as being about doing, whereas righteousness is about faith. Now we know in other places that we also see that what we do matters, but here we're talking about what it means to be uh, sort of acceptable in God's eyes rather than how we should live out our life, which, is, uh, which Paul does talk about um, in other places. Let's have a look at verse 19. We have this strange phrase here, or at least it's a very kind of pregnant phrase. It's a very uh, brief phrase that doesn't, it's not unpacked. Paul says, why then the law? 
And then he says, it was added because of transgressions until the seed would come. He doesn't really explain, what do you mean because of transgressions? Any ideas? What do you think he means? Or what might he have meant? There could be various options. Um, so not necessarily one right answer, but <laughs> what could he have meant, do you think? It says in my Bible, uh, to show people their sins. <laughs> okay, so these are your Bible study notes. Mm -hmm. Okay, so the person in the Bible study uh, who's written these particular notes says to show people their sins? Yeah. Is that right? Yeah. Yeah. So that could be one possibility, yeah, to show people their sins. Mm -hmm. <coughs> Any other thoughts? Maybe if, you know, if you don't know you're sinning, how are you going to know you need Christ? Right. So we so need to know what sin is. It's what? kind of the path mm -hmm. yep. to belief in Christ. Yep. Yeah. Yeah, that's a good point. Yeah. Yeah, Paul says a number of things uh, similar to this in Romans. He talks about the law uh, bringing about knowledge of transgressions. This is, this is just the phrase that, uh, we're going back to this phrase, transgressions. And Paul sometimes uses transgressions to talk about, we might talk about trespassing or tran in the Lord's Prayer, in the old version of the Lord's Prayer, forgive us our trespasses, particular transgressing, going over the law, uh, the specific laws that we were supposed to keep. So it could about to bring about knowledge of transgressions. Paul actually talks about the law causing them, uh, you know, raising within us the, the desire you know, Paul in one place talks about where it, where it says, do not covet, and suddenly that desire arose to covet. <laughs> you heard that law, it's like, do not, you know, don't do the thing you've just been told to do. There's a famous book called Don't Think of an Elephant, you know, like if you tell people not to think of an elephant, they immediately start thinking of an elephant, even though, and it's all about human psychology. But anyway, um, turning sins into transgressions, one thing that Paul says in uh, Romans 4, and he also talks about this in Romans 5 as well, is how... Um, there was sin in the world before the commandments. You know, Adam sinned, there was sin in the world. But when the law came in, it turned sin into transgressions because now you're actually disobeying laws that you've, specific laws that you've been given. Um, could it mean to deal with transgressions in some way or other? There was, the law did on a surface level or on a finite level deal with transgressions in the sense that if you went to a priest and you committed a particular sin and it was an intentional sin, you could offer, the priest could offer sacrifices for you, you can pay for a sacrifice to be offered to atone for your sins. That was a short-term measure. It was given by God as a system to atone for, for sins. So there's a number of things Paul might mean here. Um, if we look at verses 19 to 26, I appreciate this is a long, complicated passage to an extent, but what, what functions does he say uh, the law used to have? Um, what did it do in the past under the old covenant before Jesus came? <coughs> so this is looking at verses 19 to 26. What kind of things did the law used to do under the old covenant? What role did it have? So we've mentioned verse 19. If you look, for example, um, at verses like um, 22 and 23, sort of verses 23 to 25, for example, or 24. Well, 23 says we're kept in protective custody until the way of faith was revealed. Okay, so Bonnie's translation says, uh, we were kept in protective custody, is that right? Yes. Yeah. Uh, what else do other translations have, uh, do other people have in their Bibles? Verse 20, this is verse 23, isn't it? Yeah. Mine just says, in custody, it doesn't say protected, it says custody. In custody, yeah. Prisoner. We were prisoners, okay. <laughs> so uh, we've already had this idea of the knowledge of sin or somehow uh, showing us sin and here we have more this image of guarding and kind of imprisoning us um, why has the role of the law changed now do you think 
according to this passage? What, what's different now? Grace, yeah. Can you point us to a verse here, Al? What, what? Where has it changed, do you think? That we might be justified by faith and no longer under the supervision of the law. Okay, yeah, which, which verse is that? Is this? Uh, 25. 25, yeah. So we're no longer under the supervision of the law, yeah, since faith has come, yeah. Uh, verse 24 in my translation says it protected us until we could be made right with God through faith. Okay, so the law protected us until we could be made right with God through faith. Yeah. So we see that the law brought about uh, whatever verse 19 means, it brought about the knowledge of sin, uh, it perhaps uh, a right, um, caused to, to rise within us a desire to sin, or it turned tr sin into transgressions. Um, it also guarded and imprisoned people. Now, what does it mean by that? Well, we have a, a, a verse, um, a word in verse 24, and you may have some translations turn it into a verb, and some have it as a, um, a title or a term, like a... So I don't know what you have in verse 24, where it says something like, the law was our, our what? Now, some of them, it might just have a verb, like the law guarded us. But what do you have in verse 24 if it's not a verb? The law... Was what? Mine has tutor. Tutor. To lead us. Yeah, tutor to lead us. Verse twenty-four. Do you have led. something different? Led. The Lord just simply says the Lord led us, or does it have more than that? Well, it says, uh, the law was put in charge to lead us to Christ. The law was put in charge to lead us to Christ. Okay, so they've kind of turned it into a verb there. Yeah. We have this word. Um, we know the word uh, pedagogy, talking about teaching and and learning and this kind of thing, and the way that people learn. Um, this is a word you'll sometimes hear people use uh, in English in more formal contexts, the word pedagogue, which comes, is, comes from a Greek word here that's used. But we need to have a, a vague understand, uh, some understanding of uh, a pedagogue because this was, uh, we actually find this term used in both Greco-Roman, that's secular, and Jewish literature of the time, talking about a particular person in the household. You know, you had households, extended households, where you might have uh, extended family, you might have slaves, you might have other workers. But this is someone who was not exactly a babysitter, but they were someone who would be put in charge to supervise the conduct of the sort of younger members of the family. So like a tutor, uh, this, this translation says disciplinarian, which again is maybe doesn't quite capture it. It's, it's hard to capture with one term. Um, but it was, they would be responsible for um, like, like in some of these uh, older houses, you used to have private tutors who sort of, while the parents are away, they do the tutoring, but they're also responsible for discipline and making sure, looking after them and uh, taking the children to school, if they're going to, uh, you know, physically going to school, supervising them, administering discipline. This was a recognized job, if you like, in the ancient world. And it's saying that's what the law did. It, it, put, it put a guard of protection around us, it disciplined us, it oversaw what we did, um, it guided us. But, Paul says, he says uh, in verse 19, it was added until the offspring or the seed would come. And he explains that that seed or that offspring of Abraham wasn't just um, his descendants, plural, generally. But Paul chooses to interpret that here. There's a singular word that he's playing on to say, well, that was Jesus, that was Jesus. Similarly, in verse 23, uh, verse 22, rather, uh, he talks about faith in Jesus Christ. Verse 23, before faith came, and it seems faith coming is kind of synonymous with Christ coming. The two are going together. Verse 24, until Christ came. And then verse 25, he flips back to faith again. But now that faith has come, and then in verse 26, because we're no longer subject to this, so we're no longer these people being led to school, uh, guarded a little bit like a um, under authority. For in Christ Jesus, you are all children of God through faith. You have a different status now. So Christ has come, he's saying. It's almost like we're adults now. I mean, this is the, he talks about as children of God or sons of God, really literally. But in, the st in another sense, this uh, analogy, this image is being used to say, you're in a different status now. It's like you're now being treated as you've gone past that stage of infancy or childhood. Um, the law, in that sense, supervisory capacity is in the past because Christ has come. 
Any questions about that before we move to the next passage? We're just getting one, one part of the picture. There's some, many more things to come. So you might have other questions at the end. Right, so Al is talking about faith through obedience through the law, but in Christ we have, you could say maybe obedience flowing out of faith um, a little differently, yeah. Well, I'm just going to talk briefly about uh, Romans. There's so much you could say about the law in Romans, but we'll, be very, we'll have to be brief because of the time. So I'm just going to allude to, um, uh, we're not going to read through this passage that's on the screen because of time, but I'm just going to tell you about it briefly. So if you remember in Romans, Romans uh, Paul sets up the, the thesis, if you like, in, of Romans is that um, the gospel of God, which has come through his son, through God's son, uh, concerns righteousness for all who believe. Um, that it's for <coughs> the Jew first and then the Gentile, first in one sense in salvation history. Um, but he says in verse uh, chapter 1, <clears throat> verse uh, 16, that it's the power, the gospel is the power of God for the salvation of everyone uh, who believes, or everyone has faith. Verse 17, for in it the righteousness of God is revealed through faith for faith. You could say from faith to start, from start to finish. For it is written, the one who is righteous will live by faith. That same verse that he quoted in Habakkuk, from Habakkuk in Galatians. And then in chapter 2 and chapter 3, he's trying to, he talks about, um, and even the end of chapter 1, he starts by showing that the Gentiles who didn't have the law went away from God and they were all under God's wrath because they, they disobeyed God. At this point, the Jewish audience could think, well, I'm in the clear because I'm a good Jew. And Paul says, no, all alike are under sin. That famous verse, uh, all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God, that's in the context of a wider ar argument saying, this is not just about Gentiles, this is everybody. We're all falling short of the glory of God. Uh, none of us are sort of kept safe or, or in the clear because we have the covenant, because we have circumcision. And then Paul in, uses, um, t uh, again, uh, this is sort of the sort of irony of it, 10 different verses, verses from the Old Testament. And of course, some people saw the whole of the Old Testament as the law, even if it's the prophets or the Psalms. <coughs> to demonstrate that no one is righteous and no one will be justified by works of the law, by practice of the law. So we kind of have the bad news in Romans 1, 2, and the first half of chapter 3. Things uh, are not how they should be, and you can't get set right just by your status of being a good Jew. But then we have a famous uh, hinge, a famous pivot point in the Bible, Romans 3, verse 21. But, that's not the whole story, but now, a new era of salvation is here. The righteousness of God has been revealed apart from law. That would be a pretty shocking sen sentence. Again, we should, be make it, we should make it clear, it's not that Jewish people believed, oh, I'm saved because I obey the law. No, I'm, I'm saved because I'm one of the people of God, because God chose us out of his great love. So grace and mercy and faith are there in the Old Testament and the New Testament. But the difference was in the Old Testament, there is the condition that we're supposed to obey the law, the actual uh, law that was revealed in the Old Testament. So it's surprising when the law is so central for faith and many of the Romans, uh, Christians, reading this letter are Jewish, it's been revealed apart from the law. What does he mean? Well, there's Paul, so much that Paul says in Romans 3, 4, 5, and 6, but we are going to skip to Romans 7, again just because of time, to look at uh, a key passage on this whole discussion of what does Paul mean when he talks about uh, the law. So I'm going to read to you from verses, um, from chapter 7, verses 1 to 13. And what we'll do is we'll read verses 1 to 6, we'll pause, we'll think about that, and then we'll read the, next, the second half. So, actually just after saying in chapter 6, another famous verse, for the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is uh, eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. Paul says in Romans 7 verse 1, do you not know, brothers and sisters, for I'm speaking to those who know the law, that the law is binding on a person only during that person's lifetime? So now he seems to be playing a little bit on the idea of law generally. 
that law cannot, any kind of law can't apply to you if you're not alive. Thus a married woman is bound by the law to her husband. She is married to her husband legally as long as he lives. But if her husband dies, she's discharged from the law concerning the husband. Accordingly, she will be called an adulteress if she lives with another man while her husband is alive. She's already married. She can't be bound to another man. But if her husband dies, she's free from that law. And if she marries another man after the husband has died, she's not an adulteress. In the same way, uh, this says my friends or, or brothers, brothers and sisters, you have died to the law through the body of Christ, so that you may belong to another, to him who's been raised from the dead, in order that we may bear fruit for God. While we were living in the flesh, our sinful passions aroused by the law were at work in our members to bear fruit for death. This is one of the verses I was alluding to earlier, that the, the law um, arouses these sinful passions because of the flesh. But now we're discharged from the law, dead to that which held us captive. So we're slaves, surprisingly, they're slaves, not under the old written code, but in the new life of the spirit. You'll see a lot of contrast there, not this, but that, over and over again. So, easy sort of question here, in regard to the law then, in this little illustration, what does Paul compare our situation to? What is the little illustration or analogy he makes about our relationship to the law? What do you mean about uh, marriage and then, uh, where your marriage, as long as they're both alive, but then if uh, one of the spouses dies and that releases the, the marriage and you're free to, to remarry? Yeah. So in, in the, uh, the law, in the illustration that Paul uses, yeah, Frank was just saying if, if um, he uses the illustration of marriage, if you're married, you are legally bound to your husband, but if he dies, uh, you are free to remarry. Um, you're not bound by the old law, yeah. Any other thoughts on that? That sums it up pretty well. So we're now in a situation of a widow. She's not remarried while the husband was alive. She's not divorced him. She's no longer bound to the husband. And then Paul says, likewise, it's like we've died to the law. We're no longer bound by it. Well, let's look on. We can always come back if we have further comments. Let's look on to verses 7 to 13. So chapter 7 of Romans, verses, uh, verse 7. What then should we say, that the law is sin? By no means. We get this phrase uh, that Paul uses quite a bit in Romans that it might be translated in your version, certainly not, or by no means, or, or whatever. Uh, yet if I had not been, uh, not been for the law, I would not have known sin. I would not have known what it is to covet if the law had not said, you shall not covet. But sin, seizing an opportunity in the commandment, produced in me all kinds of covetousness. Apart from the law, sin lies dead. I was once alive apart from the law, but when the commandment came, uh, the law, uh, sorry, sin revived and I died. And the very commandment that promised life proved to be death to me. For sin, seizing an opportunity in the commandment, deceived me and through it killed me. So the law is holy and the commandment is holy and just and good. Did what is good then bring death to me? By no means, certainly not. It was sin working death in me through what is good in order that sin might be shown to be sin and through the commandment might become sinful beyond measure. So what kind of relationship do we see here between sin and the law in, this, uh, in what Paul has said in verses 7 to 13? What do, you, what do you see here about how he relates sin to the law? Mm -hmm. You're saying we're judged by sin, we're convicted by sin. Now, how does that relate to the law? If we look at the law and the sin, how do they relate together? Well, I, I'm, this is probably very simplistic, but I was thinking about keeping the law mm -hmm. apart from faith. You have this list of things that you should do if you want to be a perfect person, if you want to meet the letter of the law, 
then okay, I'm going to I'm going to meet all this list. Do well, one thousand fifty of them. It is <laughs> impossible, <laughs> of course, to keep that list to be that perfect, and therefore then you lose. You know, then you are lost. Mm -hmm. Where in faith, uh, the, it isn't a list. It's a belief. It's trust mm -hmm. in the Lord God. Okay. And uh, that and. He made the sacrifice for us, so he covers us with his blood. Okay. So Bonnie was contrasting here, uh, the law is a list of commandments to obey, and the relationship with Christ's faith being trust, um, putting your trust in him. So the, Paul says here, the law itself is not sin. The law is actually holy, righteous, and good. He says in verse 7, he says something very similar in verse 12. The law shows us what sin is. He brings, it brings sin to light, you could say. But this is one of the key things, and this, if we'd had time, we would have also looked at Romans 5 in this regard. The sin is almost portrayed like a power. It's kind of personified. It's, it does something. It's not just an abstract sort of it in the way that Paul is talking about it, thinking about it. So sin, almost like a power, took advantage of this commandment to produce the desire to obey it. You can almost think there are echoes in this passage, almost sound a little bit like the Garden of Eden. I'm given a command to do something, I feel covetous, I want to do it. You know, don't eat that, don't eat that fruit of that tree, now I want to eat it. The serpent, he's talking here about sin, not the, not the serpent, but the serpent then suggests it, it takes advantage of that, it leads to death, it cuts me off from life. And that's very much what Paul says sin uh, did with the law. Any questions about uh, that before we move on? I know it's a lot to think about. Okay, we have a little bit of time left, so we'll keep going. Um, let's look now at uh, 2 Corinthians. Uh, if you turn to chapter 3, and I'm going to come to that in a minute, I'm going to say a few things about the context first of all. So, if we think about... Um, uh, how do we explain this new attitude to the law? How do we explain the way that Paul perceives a change in his understanding of the law now as someone who was a good Jew but is now still a good Jew but is a follower of Christ? What changed for Paul? Well, one key uh, phrase is when in 2 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 6, 2 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 6, Paul refers to himself as a minister of the new covenant minister of the new covenant. Where does this language come from? Where did he get it from? You know, one simple answer might be Jesus, <laughs> because Jesus said uh, at the Last Supper, he talked about um, a new covenant in my blood for the forgiveness of sins. That language is actually picked up in Paul's um, first letter to the Corinthians, first, uh, Corinthians chapter 11, um, I think it's verse 25. But where does this language come from in the Old Testament? Do we hear about a new covenant anywhere in the Old Testament? That's a leading question, isn't it, if ever there was one? <laughs> where, might, where might the Old Testament have talked about uh, a new covenant? Abraham. Abraham? Well, that was maybe the, that was a new covenant, but it was the first covenant, yeah. Uh, but a new one that is later than that one, that's going to succeed that covenant. Well, there's a couple of well-known passages. The second one doesn't use the language of covenant, but it's very, um, very much picks up the themes of the first one. Famous passage in Jeremiah 31, 31, where talking to his people in exile, he says, the days, God says, are surely coming, says the Lord, when I will make a new covenant, is that phrase, with the house of Israel and the house of Judah. It will not be like the covenant that I made with their ancestors when I took them by the hand to bring them out of the land of Egypt. So this is the covenant he gave to Abraham. It was still the covenant that the people of God were following um, in uh, the Exodus when uh, God took them out of the land of Egypt into the promised land. A covenant that they broke, though I was their husband, says the Lord. So you get marriage language here, the idea of covenant, marriage agreement, commitment to one another. But this is the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel after those days, so later, says the Lord. And it's interesting that he said, then he explains what that covenant is, what that's uh, characterized by. I will put my law within them, within. 
not just external obedience, within. I will write it on their hearts, and I will be their God, and they shall be my people. We're going to see how Paul picks up that language in the passage we read in a moment. Then he says in uh, another passage, Ezekiel, 36, 26 to 27. Again, I'm just going to read it for you. It doesn't mention covenant, but it picks up some of the language of Jeremiah. A new heart I will give you. So again, it's the internal. A new spirit I will put within you, and I will remove from your body the heart of stone and give you a heart of flesh. I will put my spirit within you, and I'll make you follow my statutes and be careful to observe my ordinances. So interestingly, in both these passages, Paul isn't... Paul talks about the internal, new heart, new spirit, heart of flesh. Um, but it's not then to say, so then you can forget about the law. He says, no, so I'll put my law within you. I'll write it on your hearts. Um, I will empower you effectively by my spirit in Ezekiel so you can follow my statutes, you can be, observe my ordinances. Now, what does that mean? Well, we'll talk about that a bit next week, but it gives you an idea now of the theme we're looking at. So I'm going to read to you briefly as we close our session today, uh, as our last thing, I think, for today, from 2 Corinthians chapter 3. And uh, this is a whole long passage, but again, because of our time, I will just read a couple of sections. So 2 Corinthians chapter 3. And Paul has been talking to those who um, maybe are questioning his, uh, his uh, apostleship, you're asking maybe for letters of recommendation. You know, as we, we go to a new job, we might get reference letters. That kind of thing was quite normal to introduce people to other people. And he says, you yourselves, he says to the Corinthians, are our letter written on our hearts. Some translations say written on your hearts, but that's okay. To be known and read by all. And you show that you're a letter of Christ prepared for us, uh, prepared by us, I'm sorry, written not with ink, but with the spirit of the living God. Not on tablets of stone, but on tablets of human hearts. Do you see the echoes there of the verses in Jeremiah and Ezekiel? It's written on the heart. It's not the stone, but it's the fleshly, fleshy heart, if you like. The, not again here, not thinking of the passions of the flesh, but the fact it's, it's soft, it's malleable, rather than being stone and rigid. Uh, written by God, by the spirit, and you're a letter of Christ. Okay, we're going to jump down to verse 6, and he says that Christ, um, that God has made us ministers of a new covenant, not of letter, but spirit. So again, we get that contrast. For the letter kills, but the spirit gives life. A little bit like he said in Romans 7, verse 6 and elsewhere, that, this, that the, uh, the letter brings death, if you like. Now, if the ministry of death, and he's got a little analogy, he's looking back to Exodus, he's looking back particularly to when uh, Moses came down from the mountain, and you remember his face glowed, and, he, and um, he had to put sort of a veil over his face so people weren't blinded by the radiance of God that had sort of, you could say, rubbed off on him, to put it in modern language, being in God's presence. Uh, but he came with the stone tablets, the Ten Commandments. If the ministry of death, he calls it surprisingly, chiseled in letters on stone tablets, came in glory so that the people of Israel could not gaze at Moses' face because of the glory of his face, a glory now set aside, how much more will the ministry of the Spirit come in glory? For if there is glory in the ministry of condemnation, much more does the ministry of justification abound in glory. Indeed, what once had glory has lost its glory because of the greater glory. For if what was set aside came through glory, much more has the permanent come in glory. Since then we have such a hope, we act with great boldness, not like Moses, who put a veil over his face, to keep the people of Israel from gazing at the end of the glory that was being set aside or was coming to an end. There's different translations for that. Um, but, uh, or was being abolished, some say, but, in their, but uh, their minds were hardened. Indeed, to this very day, when they hear the reading of the Old Covenant or the Old Testament, that same veil is, set, uh, is still there, since only in Christ is it set aside. Indeed, to this very day, whenever Moses is read, a veil lies over their minds, meaning whenever the, the law is read. But when one turns to the Lord, the veil is removed. And we could actually also add the next verse. The Lord is the Spirit. Where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is freedom. So Paul makes uh, some contrasts here, some major contrasts. He talks about the ministry of the Spirit, and he talks about the ministry of righteousness. And he says, well, this must contain so much glory than the Old Covenant 
which brought condemnation and death. Now this would be amazing again to a Jewish person, of course Paul is a Jewish person. How can you talk about the wonderful Old Testament, you know, the Old Testament law, the Ten Commandments given by God himself from the mountain as one of death and condemnation? That seems incredible to say that. But he's saying ultimately the letter of the Old Covenant could not give life. It wasn't enough to give life. It had its purpose in the past to guard us, to guide us, to keep us, to give us a boundary, to give us frameworks, just like discipline. If you go to school, middle school, high school, elementary school, the rules there are to get a sort of to protect us and to protect other people, to keep us safe, to keep other people safe, to guide us in the right path. They're not bad in themselves, but they cannot give life. Um, they don't enable, uh, they only sentence transgressors to death, you might say. Uh, again, looking at some verses that we, uh, we don't fully have time for now. But at the same time, he says, the law that the Spirit writes on human hearts um, brings life, and it enables the law to be fulfilled. So if we had a quick um, overview of those contrasts, just as we close now, Paul uh, gives these, these opposites, these contrasts. He says the old covenant, it was of the letter, it was of the law. It wasn't a bad thing, but it didn't bring life. The spirit, though, brings life. It was a ministry of death in the sense that it could not deliver. There were stone tablets, but in the new covenant, it's, it's tablets of human hearts, just as Ezekiel and Jeremiah said, that God will write the law in our hearts, he will put his spirit in our hearts, enabling us to obey his law. The old covenant did come through glory, he does say that. It wasn't a bad thing, it was from God, but this has greater glory. Because of what it was unable to achieve ultimately, the Old Covenant was a ministry of condemnation. It couldn't bring that justification we need. We'll see next time that in Romans 8, Paul begins by saying, "Now uh, there is therefore now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. Uh, whereas uh, justification, and the glory is now set aside, it's annulled, it's abolished. But in Christ, we have a permanent glory through the Spirit. Well, we're going to have to press pause here on our discussions about Paul. I had even more things to talk about just in this first session, but our time has really run away with us. But we've begun to get, I think, a picture of uh, the role of the law for God's people that was good, that was, in, that was uh, intended for them, that had a purpose but it couldn't ultimately achieve life. It couldn't ultimately um, give us what was needed within, uh, that we needed to, to follow Christ and to live by faith. It couldn't produce faith. And this is the difference between the Old Covenant and the New Covenant. This is why Paul looks at the law differently. So in our next session, we're going to just finish off some thoughts from this. We're going to look at what does Paul put in, pr in place instead of the law for Christians, and then, okay, but we've still got this law. What does Paul say about how uh, we should use it as Christians? How does Paul use it in his own letters? Because he does in a positive way. Any uh, questions or comments? I know I've thrown a lot at you. Any questions or comments before we close in prayer? Okay, let's pray. Oh. Oh. Uh, yes, uh, let, let's pray and then we'll, we'll talk afterwards. Father, we, we thank you for uh, the time you've given us together and uh, we praise you for all that you've taught us. We thank you, Lord, that in the coming of Christ, you have written the law on our hearts, you've given us the spirit within, um, that you have delivered us from the ways of death and sin and you've given us um, the ability to have faith in you to follow your ways, to abide in your truths. So we praise you and thank you for this new covenant that you've given us, that you made Paul a minister of the new covenant and you've made us ministers of the new covenant in bringing your grace and salvation to others. Help us to live um, in the power of your spirit to follow your ways. For we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. So we look forward to being with you next week for our third session, our second part on Paul. Until then, goodbye. <laughs>